This week on The Stephen Harriet Show, Father Martin just wanted to compare Trump to Hitler, but in the process, he wound up comparing Jewish Holocaust victims to MS-13. Does Father James Martin really think right-wingers are capable of committing genocide against migrants? Nah, I think it's just political theater. It's not 3%. It's not incidental. It's completely fundamental to everything that you do. Catholic Vote Political Director Josh Mercer tells me how Cecile Richards spilled the beans. Don't be naive. Planned Parenthood is 100% about abortion. I would say there isn't a genocide yet, okay? <laughs> and the sure. watchword being yet, because there is something going on, as you point out. Speaking of genocide, do American leftists want Africans dead? I'm joined by the loved and hated Obianuju Ekocha, author of Target Africa. This is the Stephen Harriet Show by Catholic Vote, and I'm Stephen Harriet. So this week, like every week it seems, we've had another flurry of tiresome, phony, shallow political theater on both the left and the right. Are you fooled? I'm not. I think fewer and fewer of us are. What I'm getting at is this all started with a presser where Donald Trump was talking about immigration, and particularly he was asked a question about the gang MS-13, and he said of MS-13 gang members, These are people. These are animals. Immediately, enemies of border enforcement ran with the quotation, and they made it look like Donald Trump was saying that about innocent 10-year-old South American girls and immigrants in general. But again, the context was Donald Trump was saying that members of MS-13, a violent gang that really could be compared to ISIS, this is a gang that disembowels and rapes and slaughters people, he was calling them animals. First of all, real quick, this is regular language. This is not extraordinary. People call other people animals when they get mad all the time. But more on that later. Anyway, like I said, very few of us were fooled, and in the end it was very embarrassing because this coordinated effort by virtually every powerful news outlet was caught red handed, misquoting Donald Trump and trying to use the misquote against border enforcement. The Associated Press even was forced to delete a tweet. CNN even started reporting it accurately. And Jake Tapper set the record straight as well. But some commentators on the left, like cats that you catch falling ungracefully, sleeked their fur, arched their shoulders and tried to pretend like they meant to do that. So they went from saying Trump said all immigrants are animals and that's wrong to saying no, Trump said MS-13 members were animals. We knew that all along, and what we meant all along is that saying they're animals is wrong. So they all of a sudden had developed this totally inviolable principle that they were stuck defending against ever calling anyone an animal, even though this is totally regular language that most of us use all the time. But again, more on that later. What happened with this MS-13 dust-up is a perfect example of a problem that I'm seeing more and more on both the left and the right. People being opportunistic and letting the narratives of a given news cycle completely shape what they think and say. They ride the mob's mood and the media narratives like morally meaningless waves of opportunities to make themselves look really morally meaningful to their audiences. Which is to say, these people are not acting morally at all, and they don't answer to any kind of a higher power. They answer to the mob, whether it's a rightist mob or a leftist mob. And as a Catholic, I'm embarrassed to say that one of the worst offenders this time around was Jesuit father James Martin, editor of America Magazine. At first, basing his talking points on the media-driven lie that Donald Trump had just said that all migrants are animals, he tweeted, Calling people animals is sinful. Every human being has infinite dignity. Moreover, this is the same kind of language that led to the extermination of Jews, who were called vermin in Germany, and of Tutsi, who were called cockroaches in Rwanda. This kind of language cannot be normalized. It is a grave sin. And after it became very obvious that he was working with false information, he tweeted a follow-up. To be clear, even members of MS-13 are not animals. Every human being has dignity, even the worst criminals, even murderers. The main danger of the animal language is that it begins with criminals and then is applied to entire classes of people, i.e. migrants, Tutsi, 
Jews. Yeah, and I suppose arresting people for murder is just a prerequisite for eventually arresting everybody. Here's the thing. When you're operating not according to any moral truth, but just pandering to the mob, you end up getting cornered by the mob. And to please the mob that you've allowed to corner you, you end up saying and doing things that are deeply immoral. For example, Father Martin just wanted to compare Trump to Hitler, something that his leftist audience loves hearing. But in the process, he wound up comparing Jewish Holocaust victims to MS-13. What Father Martin Martin tweeted came across as anti-Semitic, as trivializing the Holocaust just to score some cheap political points, and most of all, as demagoguery, which is all about aggrandizing yourself by amorally pandering to the people. I mean, like I said, it's not like Father Martin has some eternal unbending principle against ever using the word animal to describe someone you're mad at. If anything, he just uses this prissy language policing act against his petty political enemies when they say the word animal. Okay, now, two things here. Like I said, using the word animal is totally normal language. Most of the time, just calling people that name, it's just an ordinary insult. For instance, mainstream lefty commentator Anna Navarro, a Catholic, said Donald Trump was an animal in 2016, with apologies to animals. Pope Francis himself recently said this about priests who refused to baptize the babies of unwed mothers. Father Martin never spawned any menacing conspiracy theories about how dangerous it was for Anna Navarro to compare people like Trump to animals. And he never accused the Holy Father of trying to, like, dehumanize and drum up a pogrom to go lynch radical traditionalist priests. But he did suggest that calling members of MS-13 animals could only be construed as Trump and Trump supporters trying to build up a genocidal society that would dehumanize Latinos and eventually even commit genocide against American Latinos. That's an outrageously offensive type of scapegoating accusation that Father Martin reserves for trying to pin on his political enemies, which is border enforcement advocates. But just a few weeks ago, when Donald Trump himself called Syrian President Bashar al-Assad an animal in the ramp-up to what could have been a war that Syrian and Iraqi bishops said would lead to Middle Eastern Christians being subjected to genocide, Father Martin was silent. This isn't moral principle. This is shallow, self-aggrandizing political theater. Now look, I don't blame Father Martin for not saying that Anna Navarro and the Holy Father are horrible people for saying that their enemies were animals. Like I said, most of the time, there's nothing very significant about calling people you're mad at animals. It's just ordinary insults, and there's nothing particularly insidious about it. What I do blame Father Martin for is his false, self-aggrandizing moral leadership, where he trumpets his own shining moral uprightness with meticulous, petty language policing when nothing is at stake, because this kind of self aggrandizing Grandizing showmanship is neglectful of actual innocence when they are under threat. When it came to Donald Trump's comment about MS-13, Father Martin used the language of strong morality, but not in defense of innocence, because his conspiracy theory about genociding Latinos isn't even real. Innocent lives weren't really at stake. But when meaningfully dehumanizing language is used in ways that actually could precipitate human rights violations, false moral leaders fall silent. Seems like they only act like they care when saying so will make them look good rather than actually defend innocence. And in case you think I'm being partisan, no. The right has the same problem. On the contrary, what I'm saying is trying to solve the fact that we're so partisan. See, look how ugly mobs can be, both right and left. There are a lot of people on the right whose only argument for border enforcement is migrants are violent, murderous animals. It's true. It's embarrassing, and I hate to admit it, but it's true. There are plenty of people like that on the right. Right-wing speakers and even right-wing political candidates, what they do is they march widows of people murdered by drunk drivers who happen to be immigrants out onto the stage, and they tell the sob story, and they morally grandstand, and they emotionally manipulate as if that's an argument. The reason we need border security is because all of the people outside of the U.S. are dangerous criminals is not a great argument. What is that? I mean, it's nothing but bigotry and fear-mongering. And it makes the mob like you, but morally indulges the mob and actually confuses the mob while leaving innocents to die for another day. And this brings me to the absolute central point I want to make. If you take anything away from this, I want it to be this. Here's the deal with the border debate. Innocents are actually threatened by the insecure border. 
And these innocent people are ignored by way too many people on both the right and the left. A lot like minorities in the Middle East, these innocent people being brutalized on the border are the last thing that's considered by any mob-driven demagogue. These people are victimized like you wouldn't believe because of border insecurity and the reign of unpoliced and unregulated people traffickers and cartels. Look it up. It's as bad as the Middle East. But instead, let's have a left-right argument about how we need to keep the border open and insecure because we love the poor and we love the immigrants. Meanwhile, immigrants themselves continue to die, especially illegal ones who are smuggled. Or let's talk about how Democrats are just trying to bring Mexican criminals here to take our jobs and rape our daughters. Or let's send out tweets like Father Martin about how Republicans and Trump supporters are going to commit genocide against South Americans. Only my team can save you from the Democrats, say the Republicans. Only my team can save you from the Republicans, say the Democrats. Hey, mob, follow me and I'll protect you from your political enemies. And meanwhile, innocents continue to suffer and die on the border without so much as being mentioned. Look at me, how good I am. This is not Christian. This is not working. It's not going anywhere. It's all theater. So what does good moral leadership look like? For an example, look at Tucker Carlson lately. I mean, he's not perfect, but at least he took the side of genocide victims and potential genocide victims in the Middle East versus the American pro-war push. And at least this week, he pointed out to a guest who MS-13's main victims are. MS-13 preys upon immigrants. I mean, who do you think their victims are? Overwhelmingly Honduran, Salvadoran immigrants, mm -hmm. often illegal, by the way. Illegal immigrants on the border. During this debate over MS-13, Father Martin didn't mention any of that. Instead, he just talked about how evil his rightest enemies are. Father Martin, I hate to break it to you, but you're not taking some kind of meaningful moral stand against some imaginary right-wing genocide. You're just feeding chest-thumping partisan rage, and the mob is lapping it up. But just remember, when you do this petty moral grandstanding about rude language, you're actually more like the stereotypical bigoted right-wing fear-mongering pundit than most right-wing pundits are. Know why? Because unlike Rush Limbaugh, you're not a snarky, cigar-chewing, secular entertainer celebrity. Or at least you're not supposed to be. You're a priest. You're a caretaker for the least of these brethren. And you're a moral leader in my Roman Catholic Church. Use that vocation to morally lead people. And stop letting the mob lead you. In any case, in the long run, everyone's going to see through it. And even the mob will turn on you. And as for you right-wing commentators, and, and that goes, goes for, for you, you too. too. This is the Stephen Harriet Show, the show that's so truthful its fact-checking department is in heaven. I'm your host, Stephen Harriet. And now the time has come for our weekly political discussion with Catholic Vote Political Director Josh Mercer, who has some hot, steamy news for us and some rumors. How are you, Josh? Hey, I'm doing great, Stephen. Well, I'm pretty excited because I hear a couple of rumors going on. First of all, Cecile Richards, as we know, has announced that she's going to be retiring. It's now official. She's released a book. And is she spilling interesting beans in this book? Yeah, actually, it's very funny. She did. So she sat down with an interview with Gail Collins, who's a columnist for the New York Times, very liberal, very friendly interview. And they talked about what actually made a quite a bit of news right after the election. Jared and Ivanka Trump went to Kushner, sorry, went to uh, Cecile Richards with this deal, right? The Trumps are deal makers. They said, we will let you keep all of your government funding for Planned Parenthood if you just do one thing, just get rid of abortion. If you stop right. abortion, we will not only keep your funding, Jared will lobby Congress to get you more funding for family planning. Now, I'm not a particularly fan of family planning, I understand, but that sounds like a sweet offer if you're Planned Parenthood because the claim that Planned Parenthood makes is that abortion is such a small part of what they do. Well, Gail Collins was writing this up in the New York Times and she just mocking this offer, like how ridiculous it was to offer this. She said, that's a little bit like Mark Zuckerberg getting past his business problems if he stops working with the Internet. Right, right, like, right. Wait so a minute. in other words, abortion, abortion is to Planned Parenthood as the Internet is to Facebook. Right. It's absolutely, totally essential. It's not 3%. It's not incidental. It's completely fundamental to everything that you do. This is very revealing. So 
To me, no wonder they didn't want to take the deal. That 3% myth is a complete accounting fabrication. David Chappelle says it right. That's what they do. That's why they exist. So that's why they didn't take this deal at all. So I, I just find that very revealing, even in I, a pro-abortion yeah. columnist. We should read Cecile Richard's book and maybe get her on the show. Uh, that would be interesting to hear her, her response, because I want to hear her account of the Jared Kushner meeting that she had in, in Ivanka where she met with them and details how that went. What did she say? Do we know anything about her comments about the meeting? Well, she said, she, 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 as she said to Gail Collins, she goes, I guess I was just shocked at how naive they seemed. That's what That was her <laughs> quote, how naive right. they were. In other words, as if I would ever give up abortion. Right, exactly. Apparently they believed you that abortion was only 3% of what you did. It wasn't that consequential. So why wouldn't you want to continue receiving $500 million a year to do all these essential things that you do? But Cecile's like, you're naive. Don't you get it? Like abortion is pretty much the main thing we do. <laughs> like That's right. why we're here. You know, wow. Right. Well, I mean, it is good to see, though, this sort of trajectory of Cecile Richards going out of the picture. And hopefully her moving away from public life will be paralleled by a downfall of Planned Parenthood. Are there any hopes? There's some rumors I don't of know. hopes of that I, as well. I wish she, that she would be shamed out of public society because of her role of abortion, but unfortunately, so many millions of Americans continue to think abortion is a good thing or an important thing, sadly. She's even hinted that she might run for elective office. You know, her mom was Ann Richards, the governor of Texas. So, right. you know, she has that in her, in her blood. She took time out from Planned Parenthood for a few months and campaign for Barack Obama in 2012. So she's got it in right. her blood. She loves politics. She would be absolutely disastrous, of course, but I think she's, she's got a lot of money. Against. She's got a lot of cunning. I, I you know, yeah. I, I don't think the people of Texas would elect her to any statewide office, but, you know, she right. might run for Congress. She, Who knows? She'd get the Wendy Davis treatment, I think. What about rumors I'm hearing of finally, please God, defunding Planned Parenthood? We have the Mexico City policy, which Donald Trump reinstated, which yeah. prevents foreign aid. It prevents it from going to any organizations that refer or commit abortions. That's a great policy. And in fact, he expanded on it. He made it even stronger and better. The question then is, what about domestic money? That's really, you know, we care about that obviously very much too. Yeah. Uh, what 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 the, the hope is right now, the administration is considering a proposal that would cut off major funding for because of the way the law is, you wouldn't be able to cut off 100 percent through executive order. You really do need Congress to do it completely. But there yeah. is a way to restrict any family planning clinics from receiving Title X funding. If you commit abortion, you won't get the federal funding anymore. And so this policy actually started in 1988 by President Ronald Reagan, but there was an immediate court fight on it. It got tied yeah. up in courts. The Supreme Court finally in 1991 gave the green light and said, yes, you can do this. You know, you can restrict Title X funding to just family planning clinics that don't perform abortions. That's fine. And just as they're starting to ramp this up and implement it, Bill Clinton's elected president, he gets in there and cuts it right out. So right. it was sort of cut off right at its wings. You know, executive order does have the force of law and it's limited in its scope. Right. In other words, the next president can get rid of it. Absolutely. You're only going to be able to do a portion of the funding, not all of it. I mean, we are talking about millions of dollars, so it, it would be a great action if he did it. But just so we understand, yeah. a legislative solution is going to be a lot better anyway, or an appropriation solution. But this way, at least... Right. You know, we came one vote short in the Senate on defending Planned Parenthood. Uh, now we're two votes shy, unfortunately. But right, right. now we have this ability through, with the possibility of the, the Trump administration putting through an executive order to cut off a lot of the funding. So if you want to get Title X funding for family planning services, you can't commit any abortions. That'd be a great policy. And of course, if he does it, you're going to expect court challenges right from the get go. But I think the Supreme Court in 1981 was would have been a lot less uh, amicable to this. And even they said, yes, the Supreme right. Court is better now in 2018 than it was in 81. So I think there's not going to be any legislative problem. It's still going to have to work its way through the system. So, all right. Well, thank you for mostly good news, Josh. This has been a pretty good week, huh? Well, we just try to illuminate people what's going on. Some of the stuff that goes on behind the scenes. One way you can try to keep up to date, obviously, watching the Stephen Harriet show, but also subscribing to the Catholic Vote's free daily email newsletter. It's called Loop. Just go to catholicvote.org, Loop, and uh, sign up. All right. Thank you very much, Josh. Can't wait to talk to you next week. All right. Thanks, Stephen. I'm now joined by Obianuju Ekocha. She is the author of a terrific book called Target Africa, which I have on my desk and which is covered in uh, dog ears and, and filled with ink by me. But 
The original ink is brilliant, and I highly recommend the book, and I'm honored to have the author with me. Good to see you, Obianuju Ekocha. Thank you for joining thank, us. Thank you, Stephen, for having me, and I'm really excited to be on your shows. This is great for me. Thank you. You've been busy. I see you every time I get online, you're in a different country or a different state, and you're spreading the message. Your message is a powerful one. As the subtitle indicates, tell our viewers a little bit, if you would, Uju, about the idea of ideological neocolonialism in Africa. What, what is that? Right. So this is a term that I think most people know of, but they don't, you know, they just don't have a term or a word for it. But the, the actual phenomenon has been happening for a couple of decades now. People have seen it. People have witnessed it. People kind of know it, but they just don't have a name. So that's why we've pinned a name to it in the book, Ideological Neocolonialism. It's found within the relationships between African nations and their Western donors, the, the Western countries that give them foreign aid, the organizations that come into Africa as donors, and even like the agencies and foundations, like for example, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So within that give and take relationship, that recipient and donor relationship, we then find it more and more increasing that the donors who are powerful, who are usually Western and who are usually wealthy, they come with their own ideas, with their own ideals, with their own ideologies, and they are trying to impose it. You know, it's kind of a gentle imposition upon the African people to corrode or erode our own cultural views and values, especially when it comes to sexual morality, issues that have to do with marriage or the sanctity of life or the way the Africans understand human sexuality. So ideological neocolonialism in a way just describes that, that there is a new colonial, there's a colonialism going on. They, they're trying to kind of annex the Africans to take us into their own way of thinking. And I must say here in full disclosure, I didn't coin the term. Uh, most recently, the term was kind of popularized by Pope Francis, who mentioned it during his address at the United Nations in 2015, as well as some other places where he was, especially when he would go to a third world country, just saying that these people don't want these values, but the wealthy donors come from the West and they come with these values and these visions and these definitions of the world and they're trying to impose it upon us. Right. One aspect that many people miss is a very raw, simple aspect that any populist in the age of Trump should be able to understand, right. which is that cultural Marxism and the tenets of radical feminism, of sexual ideology, of the LGBT movement, and of family planning ideology and, and abortion, all of those things are just plain unpopular in much of Africa, as they oh. once were in the U.S. And in the U.S., it took a lot of campaigning and propaganda to increase the approval ratings for these horrible things. But in Africa, we're almost getting a snapshot of something earlier, where these people are, as recently as Pew polled in the area in 2014, totally against, for instance, abortion, yeah. And yet it's being aggressively shoved down their throats. What about that? Yeah, exactly. So it's so rare that you find pollsters coming in to see how the Africans see things, to take up our views or our values, to know exactly what, what do we want, what do we care about, what are the things yeah. that are important to us. But every time they poll us, it's very impressive to find that sometimes as much as 80% of the population would say that they find abortion reprehensible, they find abortion completely unacceptable, something like the homosexual lifestyle, whenever that they poll, it's always in the 90 percentile of populations within African nations saying we will never accept this kind of lifestyle, no matter wow. what, as a normal part of society. So they have stopped polling, also they don't like to poll us because whenever it happens, you find all of that as well. But in addition to these kinds of, let's say, evidence-based, I will even say anecdotally, that what I find or what I have found just growing up in Africa, being being born in Africa, being raised in Africa, I went to university in Africa, I grew into adulthood in Africa. These kinds of things, these, let's call them the elements of the sexual revolution as it has been in the West, are completely yeah. rejected and abhorred by most people within uh, African countries. Yeah, it reminds me of a recent episode I did that commented on gay marriage, made it onto Right Wing Watch and also Secular Talk, which is a leftist, atheistic, anti-Christian podcast. Right. And this guy made fun of me because I'm I mentioned populism, and I, I mentioned the idea of there is some danger to letting the people, quote unquote, decide, right? Mm -hmm. Because demagogues love pure democracy. And they, that's, that's how you establish tyrannies, in fact, is by saying, oh, it's up to the people. And yeah. then you give the people candy and yes. you make them say what you want them to say. <laughs> that's um, right. But it's funny to me because, and he was saying, look at this elitist guy who's saying, don't listen to the people on gay marriage. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. But in fact, I was like, what are you talking about? Your entire project has been rejecting what the majority of people think. Secularism exactly. and secular leftism required an, a century-long, aggressive, disdainful, and destructive push against ordinary people in the U.S. Well, precisely. They say that, and then yet they come to Africa and they completely ignore what the people say. And I totally agree with you. There is a danger to mobocracy, if you like, you know, where you say, let the people decide. But for the Africans, this is more rooted in the culture. This is more rooted from our cultural heritage. We didn't just become against uh, abortion. We didn't just realize how horrible abortion is. These things are very intricately uh, tied to our own cultural views, our own cultural values. For example, a lot of the African cultures and customs believe in the bloodlines, preserving the names and the bloodlines of our ancestors before us and the generations coming after us. So a pregnant woman, for example, is not only just seen as a pregnant woman, but she is carrying the name of her family forward. She's carrying the life or, you know, the bloodlines of her ancestors forward to make sure that, you know, that bloodline continues to persist. So we believe in those kinds of things and there is no way that a culture that believes so strongly in where we have come from in terms of our heritage and in terms of our you know family genealogy and where we're heading to there is no way that culture can coexist with something like abortion because for you to be able to turn around and abort a baby in the womb that means you're going to have to completely either silence this other part where you know my grandmother told me what her grandmother told her is that you know we are carrying the precious bloodlines of the ancestors who have who have lived and worked hard before us. So that's how it is. And that's why sometimes, for example, if I digress a little bit, that I feel a little bit sorry, well, quite sorry, actually, for the African-American populations, because we in Africa believe that they carry our bloodlines. You know, they are mm. the Americans who have within them the bloodlines. It doesn't matter how many hundreds of years ago, but they are carrying the bloodlines of tribes, of ancient tribes in Africa that still exist. And right. yet, they are the ones who are having the most abortions. They are the ones who are more affected by the kind of attack that Planned Parenthood is having in minority communities. So we see it now as African bloodlines are being completely killed off within abortionist clinics. So yeah. so that's, you know, that's the story there. And yeah, exactly. Well, it's so, funny, and actually so also African, African America, interestingly, a lot like Latino America, for some reason, at the same time as being, according to polling, actually, they've resisted a lot of progressivism in their mm. personal lives. Yes. Um, and yet, but yet strong and they live, can, right? Yeah, and they're and yet they bear the brunt of the kind of cultural decay that progressivism propels. That's right. And so, and so it's interesting. True. I mean, like, I wonder if there will be. I don't know if you've heard of Candace Owens and Kanye West and that whole hubbub in the U.S. Mm. But Candace Owens, if nothing else, is strongly pro-life. Mm-hmm. And it would be cool to see a cultural shift where you you have that. It would be cool to see that, like you said, for people to rise and forget Wakanda. You don't have to invent an artificial <laughs> African nation. Exactly. Did, what did you think of that, Wakanda, and the whole talk of like no, African but, pride? In a, in a, in a, in a, <laughs> yeah, but the African pride does <laughs> exist to today. It exists within African communities. I thought and it only culture. existed in the Marvel Universe. Would you? <laughs> no, but seriously, I went and watched that movie, Black Panther. I totally enjoyed it. But people think uh, or reduce Africans just to the beautiful clothes we wear or the colorful clothes we wear or our colorful art or, you know, our food and the way we dance and our drums and all of that. But I'll tell you what makes an African. An African is made of their cultural views and values. That is the part of the African that you can never really take out of the African. So we wear our clothes and we wear all of these things, but they're just superficial. And if you read the book, Target Africa, you would find that I talk a lot about like our customs, our culture, when a marriage occurs, what happens uh, during, a, during a traditional marriage in Igbo land yes. where I come from and why it is those male female companies complementarity. Yeah, they call us homophobic, but I would say that we are going back hundreds of years, you know, within right. our culture, within our custom, within our own understanding of what, uh, you know, sexuality between a man and a woman means and what that joining means and portends for the entire society or for the entire culture. Uh, so so th- these are things that they have to know about the Africans, but they're still not getting it. <laughs> yeah, let me let me ask you about that, because some of the most insightful passages in Target Africa are about language. Yes. So you mentioned for instance, the language around marriage and around family, which is the primary target of cultural Marxism and leftism in the U.S., inborn in your native language Mm -hmm. that you spoke growing up is stuff that would have to be annihilated to make way for progressive policies. You cannot 
they can't coexist with sexual ideology, right? Absolutely not. I mean, these and th that's why the Africans should hold firmly onto their language because within our language has been encoded by our ancestors the things to, to guide us for generations to come, right? Mm. So we are absorbing everything good uh, that is coming in the world now, the education. We love all of that. I love it that I can speak English to you, but I'm also very grateful for my own mother tongue, the Igbo language that I speak. You know, I still speak to today. I spoke growing up, we will find within that language preserved things like male-female complementarity and how impossible it is that you can separate that and give us like same-sex marriage, for example, because within our culture, even just the way we say sex, you know, when, when you talk about sexual intimacy, if you translate it into my language, the only way it comes out is the relationship between man and woman. I mean, it's, there is no other way. Ah. It said, that's there is so there is no other way of shifting it to mean something else you know to right. kind of as english is now being twisted and, and reshaped and reformed so that it can absorb all the new things that the sexual revolution is bringing to us yeah. and the same thing with abortion as well how we talk about abortion is such a way that it can never really be made neutral or even good you know how now we're hearing more and more things like abortion is healthcare. we heard that this weekend from people like uh, yeah, i think senator kamala harris we've heard it from yeah. Planned parenthood they're trying to bring in other parts of language that will make abortion seem nice or seem good or positive. In the Igbo language, it's impossible. And most of the African languages are like that as well. It's impossible. Abortion always comes up as an abomination. Right. Yeah. Well, it's, it's so funny to me because also, if Western kooky progressivism is foreign to African nations, what's embarrassing about you, Uju, is that you show really loud and clear that African culture is foreign to the BBC, for example. Last year, you did an interview with a BBC anchor. Hundreds of millions of women do not have access to contraception. The fact yes. remains that hundreds of millions of women don't have access and should. You're saying should, but but who are, who are you to decide if I if you don't mind me saying well, because the not, thing is so there much, isn't there isn't a popular demand ma'am there isn't a popular demand but it's um, a basic human right to have access to it so it is part is of that cycle of poverty and dealing with poverty and overcoming poverty, is it not? Well, that's kind of a Western solution, isn't it? If they have access to contraception, if they can deal with birth control, if they can have a family planning uh, program in place, then it deals with the issues well, of, of poverty as that well. That is the Western solution. Why don't you listen to the people first? Good it's government. about These education kind of as well, so that they understand their basic human rights. It's not just about well, the West coming rights, and imposing to you, something. These, these are are colonial thoughts so you better be careful expressing them according to whom you're then also generalizing speaking on behalf of you know every woman on the continent well, so saying that the you. majority of so them so are you you're talking about a general solution when africa is actually not a monolithic society well, all i'm society. saying is that they should have the right to have access the united nations says that more than 200 million women don't have access to it but how many of those 200 million women are actually asking for it perhaps for? they're unaware well, it's for someone like yourself, you know, someone so kind and generous from the West to come tell them that what they need is contraception to come out of poverty. Now you give them contraception, and the next day they still don't have work. The following year they still don't have work. I'll so be, they turn I'll be up Naju, to be... I, I, I've, I would really love to discuss this further, yeah. further with you. We're just 10 seconds to go off air. So thank you very well, much for, for joining. Thank you, thank, thank you for Thank you very much for joining us here on the program. Do stay with us. We've got lots more coming. She was like, you are gross what is wrong with you? she treated you as so foreign she was so disdainful she was so flabbergasted she was like you are i mean it reminded me of late 19th century uh mm -hmm. folks talking about savages which you talk about in your book like what is wrong with you who are you well she's just a nigerian that's what and I'm just an ordinary Nigerian, trust me. I am not even, like you say, conservative. No, well, I'm just the regular mainstream Nigerian, right? What right. I'd say is not going to be much different from what any other person would say. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but people don't hear us, you know, but I, I thank God now that something like, you know, the Black Panther has come in. So at least there's some interest. There is some innocent interest in the yeah. African culture and custom. But what I would beg is that people go a little bit deeper than the nice 
clothes and the Wakanda clothes and the Wakanda salute to come down to it to to get the the culture and customs that make up the African people. Yeah, and they can learn and those that from make you. us very strong. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, okay. So one last thought I really wanted right. to I really wanted to insist on discussing because this Great. this is something I came across in my research on the persecution of Christians in the Middle East. Right. There is online you can find it from the UN, an analysis framework regarding genocide. Now, first of all, the legal definition of genocide, any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group. It lists a bunch of actions. One of them is imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. Another element here is that under the section about establishing the intent, so evidence of intent to destroy in whole or in part, etc., one of the things listed is the destruction of or attacks on cultural and religious property and symbols of the targeted group that may be designed to annihilate the historic presence of the group. Now, that reminds me of what you said about language. In your native language, you could say those words are symbols. And they really do have to be annihilated to make way exactly. for the cultural acceptance of some of these things. There's something really insidious going on here. I wouldn't say that there's a genocide happening in Africa necessarily, but they're certainly laying the groundwork for it under the definitions provided by the UN itself in 1948. What are your thoughts on that? Right. I would say there isn't a genocide yet okay <laughs> and the sure. watchword being yet because there is something going on as you point out and they are heading towards it the, if they are plowing in as much as nine billion dollars a year for what they call population programs into african nations for us to cover things like condoms contraception and even abortion comprehensive sexuality education which of course is trying to gear and prepare the african children for the new version of sexual revolution that has already happened in the West. They're trying to kick it off, starting from our children, by trying to bring in comprehensive sexuality education into African schools. So right. I do believe, along the lines of what you are saying, that there is something going on. They are heading towards it. They are fighting Africans in so many ways without the Africans themselves sometimes realizing it is quite insidious. Uh, they're going after things like our values. You know, they're defining rights in such a way that if we, if we think about it as Africans, if we lay out our language and put it side by side by the definition of rights that has been made by yeah. Western nations at places like the United Nations, uh, you would find out that they are trying to either eclipse what we already know through our language, they are trying to clean it off and delete in many ways some parts of our language and some parts of our culture. Uh, they're trying to get us to submit completely to their own definitions of everything. You know, they've def redefined marriage. So now it's for us to submit to their definition of marriage. Uh, they've defined, they're trying to define uh, right to life means they're trying to get us to, to see it this other way. You know, irrespective of the fact or regardless of the fact that we come from this, you know, we have our own heritage and things that in fact are diametrically opposed to what is being set up in the West. So it's a kind of a deletion. It's a kind of a, a removal or erasure, if you like, of, of what already exists among African countries or among mm -hmm. African customs. Uh, and of course, yes, in the way that they're, they're pushing now population control through really sugar-coated projects and airbrushed schemes coming from really beautiful people like, you know, like the right. Gates Foundation, right? The way they're pushing all of these things in, it's such that the Africans sometimes, again, don't realize it. But if you stand back and take a look at the bigger picture, you would find that indeed they are trying to wage war against the fertility of the African woman. And they yeah. are trying to stop us from having children at all costs. And yet they're telling us it's for our own good. And they're telling us that people are asking for it. Why don't they go and take several polls across the different African countries to know what people actually think about contraception or how important, for example, uh, contraception would be when you ask an African and women, what is important to them or what is important in their lives. That's right. And you've touched on a lot of elements just there that are in this book that we don't have time right. to get to. We cannot, in this interview, adequately recommend this book. It is to be recommended <laughs> more highly than I'm capable of recommending in an interview. But it is very, very good, Uju. I'm really just stunned by it. I think that also it has incredible implications that will ripple out and wake up a lot of people who realize, hmm, I have equal human dignity to these Africans, mm -hmm. and I should stand up for my cultural beliefs and my roots. Very good, very in, good. In the, in the U.S., we're under attack in a similar way, not exactly the yes. same, 
but we shouldn't be apologizing. We should be as unapologetic as you are, Uju. And I think I'm glad you're leading the way in a very powerful thank way. Thank you. Thank so. you, Stephen. I'm so glad that we could talk about this today. Yes, thank you for uh, coming on the show. And I, I let, come on again. Let's uh, talk regularly. Most certainly. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you, Uju. Well, that's it for this week. This has been the Stephen Harriet Show by Catholic Vote. And if beauty is in the eyes of the beholder, then viewer, your eyes are gorgeous. I'm your host, Stephen Harriet. See you next week.